Ibn Sina was the first major innovator in formal logic after the ancient Greeks, I mean Aristotle and the Stoics. He was at the height of his powers in Persia just a thousand years ago. He's commonly known in the West as Avicenna, which is a sort of Latin mispronunciation of Ibn Sina. I'll try to be consistent and stick to the name Avicenna, but I have to apologise for my teeth. If I say something that you can't make any sense of, then I'm probably trying to say Avicenna and my broken dentures are getting in the way. In this talk, I'm going to report some recent research on Avicenna's logic, which has begun to study his earlier writings, including his teenage book, Shorter Epitome in Logic, from around AD 994, a bit over a thousand years ago. In this book, he introduces a new logic, which he calls recombinant hypothetical syllogisms. For lack of time, I won't explain here what he means by recombinant and hypothetical. Avicenna's idea of a logic is based on Aristotle's logic of categorical syllogisms. I won't assume you know these, so I'll give a quick introduction. There are four sentence forms that are called categorical as follows. Every B is an A, no B is an A, some B is an A, and not every B is an A. And the last is equivalent to some B is not an A. Here B and A are called the term letters and we can replace them in any of these sentence forms by any two different letters. Aristotle has 14 categorical syllogisms. Now a categorical syllogism is a two premise inference rule with two categorical sentences as its premises and one categorical sentence as conclusion and we generally mark the conclusion by writing therefore in front of it. I'll give two examples. One, every C is a B, no B is an A, therefore no C is an A. If you think for a bit, that should convince you. That syllogism is commonly known by the Latin name Kayla Rent. Ibn Sina, Avicenna didn't know the Latin names, but it's useful to have them. Another example, Latin name Ferison, premises, some B is a C, no B is an A, conclusion, Therefore, some C is not an A. Now, these inference rules become actual inferences if we put a noun in place of the letter A at both occurrences, a noun in place of B and a noun in place of C. For example, we had Kaylorent above. Every C is a B, no B is an A, therefore no C is an A. From this we can get the actual inference, every tree is a plant, no plant is an animal, therefore no tree is an animal. Now for what is going to come later, it's very important to note that for both Aristotle and Avicenna, what matters is not the actual nouns but the concepts that they express. For example, as an example for Kayla Rent, we could also write, every tree is a has leaves. No, has leaves is an animal. 
therefore no tree is an animal. Where has leaves is a concept of a kind of thing and trees are all examples of that kind of thing. Now as it stands what I've just said is not grammatical. We can't just shove has leaves in a place where there should be a noun but it's easy to adjust it so that the syntax works and say every tree has leaves nothing with leaves is an animal therefore no tree is an animal and Aristotle and Avicenna will both count that as a good example of a categorical syllogism so that's categorical logic Avicenna creates his recombinant hypothetical logic by taking the syllogisms of ordinary categorical logic but reading them in a different way. His idea is that the letters, the term letters, X, Y and Z and so on, um, should be replaced not by nouns but by sentences and we'll use the letters P, Q and so on to stand for sentences. For example, take the categorical syllogism Kellerent, which we saw earlier, it's every C is a B, no B is an A, therefore no C is an A. Now, put sentences instead of nouns in place of the letters C, B and A. I'll put the sentences in brackets. And it's best if you can see the text to see where the brackets are. Every Ahmed is walking is an Ahmed is changing place. So we've got the sentences Ahmed is walking and Ahmed is changing place. No Ahmed is changing place is an Ahmed is at rest. Therefore, no Ahmed is walking, is an Ahmed is at rest. Now, according to Avicenna, although this syllogism as it stands doesn't make much grammatical sense, we work it by using the same mental operations as if it was a categorical syllogism. And so the rules that it follows are going to be analogous to the categorical rules. But we've got to rephrase it so that it makes grammatical sense. For example, in categorical syllogisms, the phrase every tree quantifies over the class of trees, i.e. over the class of things that tree is true of. So every sentence Ahmed is walking quantifies over the class of things that the sentence Ahmed is walking is true of. Uh, I.e. Uh, well Avicenna says different things on different occasions but either times or situations or to use his favorite word posits in which Ahmed is walking. And Avicenna uses the phrase when Ahmed is walking to refer to the class of times or situations or posits in which Ahmed is walking. So, using a kind of temporal language, uh, we can tidy up the syllogism so that it reads Always when Ahmed is walking, Ahmed is changing place. It is never the case when Ahmed is changing place that Ahmed is at rest. Therefore, it is never the case when Ahmed is walking that Ahmed is at rest. And this is a recombinant hypothetical syllogism. We can tidy it a bit further. In Arabic, just as in English, always when 
can be contracted to whenever. So we can write, whenever Ahmed is walking, Ahmed is changing place. It is never the case when Ahmed is changing place that Ahmed is at rest. Therefore, it is never the case when Ahmed is walking that Ahmed is at rest. Well, that's taken a whole syllogism and converted all three sentences of it from categorical to hypothetical. But actually, the translation can be done separately for each categorical sentence. Uh, in fact, if you look back at what we did, the first step is to take your categorical sentence and change gear so that it's doesn't use nouns, it uses sentences. And we'll express that by putting P and Q in the appropriate place. And the second step is to look at what we got and shake it down so as to uh, make a grammatical sentence. Uh, let's look at some examples. There are four kinds of categorical sentence. The first is, every B is an A. Changing gear, that becomes... Every when P is a time when Q. And shaking that down, it becomes whenever P, then Q. The second kind of categorical sentence is no B is an A. That changes gear to no when P is a time when Q. And that shakes down to never when P is it the case that Q? Actually, we can say that slightly differently as it is never the case when P, that Q. That means the same. Then there are two existential categorical sentences. The first is, some B is an A. That changes gear to some when P, is a time when Q. And that shakes down to sometimes when P, Q. Note here, the sentence some B is an A, that's a categorical sentence, is equivalent to some A is a B. And passing from one of these two sentences to the other, it's an operation that the Aristotelian logicians refer to as conversion. Well, that's one of the mental operations that uh, we can perform with categorical sentences. So its analogue works as well with hypothetical sentences. In other words, if we've got sometimes when P, Q, we can convert it to sometimes when Q, P. Avicenna picks out this conversion and um, emphasizes it in his early book, Shorter Epitome and Logic. Then there's uh, one more kind of existential sentence that we can write in two different ways. First way is, not every B is an A. Changing gear, that's it is not the case that every when P is a time when Q. And shaking that down gives us, it is not the case that whenever P, Q. Now the other way of saying this same categorical sentence is, some B is not an A. Changing gear, that becomes some when P, is a time when not Q. And that shakes down to sometimes when P, not Q. In one of his early writings, Avicenna remarks that the sentence sometimes P and not Q is hypothetical when you think about it. What he's saying here is that sometimes P and not Q is another way of saying sometimes when P, not Q. 
Now that's curious because some people today deny that, say these are not equivalent, that you can't use an and to express an existential hypothetical sentence. Well, they're wrong, but um, it's interesting that um, the fact that Avicenna makes this remark suggests there may already have been people in his time who denied this. There's also evidence that some early readers of Avicenna's logic thought there must be an if-then somewhere in the sentence, sometimes when P, Q. And in the 12th century, we find Abu Barakat explaining Avicenna's hypothetical logic, says, when we say it is sometimes the case when this is an animal, that it is a human, there is no entailment in it. Well, that's given us, starting from the 14 categorical syllogisms, 14 hypothetical syllogisms, and so that set up the new logic. There are several modern publications that claim to describe Avicenna's hypothetical logic. To the best of my knowledge, none of them correctly report the recombinant hypothetical logic. The best is Salwa Chatti's account in her book Arabic Logic from Al-Farabi to Averroes, dated 2019, where the four recombinant hypothetical sentences are described as quantified conditional propositions. This is on her page 286. So what is the cause of these failures? Let me mention three causes that stand out. The first cause is that nearly all published accounts are based on Avicenna's writings from the second half of his career. So they miss out the works in which he first developed his hypothetical logics. The second cause is that it's widely believed that Avicenna had just one hypothetical logic. This is completely false. Already in shorter epitome and logic, he had two hypothetical logics that had no formal sentences in common. The number of his hypothetical logics grew soon after that. There's a different kind of confusion uh, caused by existential affirmative uh, recombinant hypothetical sentences like sometimes when P, Q. Now we saw that sometimes quantifies over when P not over the whole phrase, when P, then Q. But not all modern writers on Arabic logic make clear what this distinction is, these two different parsings. For example, Guachon, in her French translation of Avicenna's pointers, translates in French, sometimes when the sun is up, the sky is cloudy. Now, that's ambiguous. It could mean at some of the times when the sun is up, the sky is cloudy, and that's correct. But there are two words that could be read as time quantifiers there, namely sometimes and when. And if you separate the sometimes from the when, you could think that these are two separate time quantifications. And if you do that, then uh, you may well come up with a, a reading that is along the lines, there are intervals of time during which, whenever the sun is up, the sky is cloudy. But that's certainly wrong because it doesn't convert. And we saw that this sentence does convert. Nicholas Rescher, the great pioneer of Arabic logic, is partly responsible for this. He is one of the few logicians who give correct translations 
of the recombinant hypothetical sentences using symbolic sentences based on first order logic. But then he also offers English translations and he writes, for example, sometimes colon when p q. Now by putting the colon there between the sometimes and the when, he is making the main break in that place and that's precisely the wrong place to make the break as we've just seen. Salwa Chati, in her book Arabic Logic from Al-Farabi to Averroes that we mentioned earlier, gives both symbolic translations and English translations for the recombinant hypothetical sentences. Her symbolic translations are essentially the same as Resha's and I reckon that this part of her account is the best available. But when she gives English translations, then at least to my ear, she makes the main break in exactly the wrong place. She doesn't use Resha's colons, but they seem to have had a strong influence on her English translations. I have the impression that Resha's colon notation has confused everybody who has used it. Thank you.